Uh, this is our speaker tonight, uh, Dr. Lola Oni Oteri. Uh, she'll be talking the 5G revolution and she has uh, degrees in electrical engineering from uh, Georgia Tech and in telecommunications from Stanford. Uh, our, she is now a principal engineer at Qualcomm. I had to hurriedly edit my slide because she was a, a senior systems engineer uh, in the original slide, and I see I mistyped principal. I put an extra I in it, apologies to that. Um, but she has a lot of experience in the communications industry. She's been at Texas Instruments, AT&T Labs, NCS Scientific Atlanta, the owner of uh, 16 patents. And with no further ado, I will stop sharing my screen and pass this on over to Dr. Lola Oni or Terry. Hi everyone and uh, thank you, uh, Michael. Thank you to the whole team for inviting me tonight. Um, I'm happy to be here. And um, just a, a quick, quick uh, correction on the, the patent side. I do have over 40 um, US patent approved and uh, 150 worldwide, a patent approved um, worldwide. Uh, well, sorry, I shortchanged you on that. I think I got that off your LinkedIn profile or something, but uh, uh, just, uh, didn't give you as much credit as you deserve, so. No, you're uh, totally right. Yeah, it needs to be updated. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay. So I'm just trying to bring up my slides here. Um, can you guys see my slides? Yes, I can see them. Thank you. Uh, so today I will be talking about the, the 5G revolution. And um, I think as I proceed through the talk, it would actually become obvious why um, I view it uh, as a, a revolution really um, in terms of the progress that has been made in this area. And in terms of the organization of the talk, I will start by first kind of sharing what the 5G vision was, uh, what services are, what the requirements was that were set for 5G. And then we will move on and then discuss what, what is the 5G design? What are the key technologies that actually enable 5G? And then we'll, we'll look at some of the commercialization that has been done in 5G. And then we'll proceed to look at the future of 5G, how, what uh, technology or what are we looking at in the future of 5G? And then how is 5G really evolving? And as we see the impact of 5G across time, I think it becomes obvious why this is actually a revolution from where things started from. Um, and, and initially the way it's being started from, as we could see that cellular has really changed the way we all communicate. It, it, then in the olden days, they started from this um, rotary phones where we would uh, only use them for voice, right? And that was what we had then. And now today we have um, mobile devices that can access the internet. We have mobile devices where we can stream uh, content, um, it, uh, uh, terabits and terabits of, of data. And by uh, 2025 is envisioned that we would have 8.9 uh, billion uh, mobile subscription uh, all over the world. So it's, you could see the, how the impact of uh, the mobile industry has really grown over time. And this um, happened in phases. So it started from uh, the 1G system in, in the 1980s where we did have this analog voice, we had the AM phones, and then it, it did evolve, as we could see, to the cases where we have now, we could digitize the voice and then it was carried on GSM or the IS-95. That was the early days of the, the CDMA technology. And then it went into having uh, mobile phones or handsets, that's the, the 3G version where we could actually um, transfer mobile data um, over, over the phone. And we had this kind of like a wireless uh, connection to, to the ethernet. Then the standards then were WCDMA, HSPA plus, uh, CDMA 2000 was different standards um, kind of converge. And then we had kind of a, a convergence in, in, in 4G where now we ended up with this mobile broadband where we can stream um, data and where we, we had broadband uh, connections on our phones. And this is emerging until we got to this uh, 5G uh, what I call I call it the 5G revolution, and and as you can see, this progress has been happening actually every on the average every 10 years is when we see the improvement from one generation to another. And in this 5G revolution, what what we see our evolution, as some people call it, is that um, now we um, we are not only looking at the mobile phone, we are actually looking at a disruption to the entire to to multiple industries. Uh, um, so we are moving beyond just a communication 
to agriculture, to, to healthcare. And there, there, there is exactly where the revolution comes from because uh, the, this 5G is really changing the landscape of not only the mobile industry, of, of, but uh, multiple industries and multiple devices. And, um, and the 5G standards is called the, the 5G new radio. And just to, to kind of give you a cap, uh, this is a name given by the, the major standardization body that is um, in charge of actually bringing the 5G to, to life. And that's the, the 3GPP, which is the third generation uh, partnership project. Um, that is a, a, a group of stakeholders, companies from all over the world, um, infrastructure um, vendors, uh, manufacturers, Operator, network operators, um, companies like Qualcomm that make uh, reference handsets coming together, this group of com companies coming together and defining what the next generations of um, features that we have for with this uh, mobile revolution would be. And, th and that group, the 3GPP, is what named this fifth generation of uh, kind of the mobile uh, communication as we know it, the 5G new radio. Um, and, and so the, the, the vision of really 5G was that it would address this um, growing, ever growing need for mobile broadband that um, it, since we were ending up with gigabits and gigabits of monthly data actually on the, on the web and, and, and billions of gigabits of, of data, uh, the question was we needed a kind of like a mobile broadband uh, type connection to actually be able to transmit this level uh, of communication. And so by, by 2024, uh, the, the, the projection is that 75% of the data uh, that we have uh, will be for multimedia uh, creation. So a lot of this is happening on social media uh, platforms, uh, it's happening in uh, networks that we, we have and, and over our PCs, we, we have huge tons of data that we are generating. And this was one of the driving force for actually um, 5G. And then in terms of the use cases that we, we, we expect to, to see, you can see that we want, we want to be seeing uh, mo mobilizing media and entertainment over the hands, that you want to watch a video over, uh, or, or a movie over your phone um, in, 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 and not have it throttle back. You want consistent um, kind of performance as you watch your video. You want to be able to capture um, a, a picture um, over a, a large sc uh, scale with, with great resolution. You also want to be able to go to a stadium and watch and watch a, a, a game, hopefully when COVID is over, <laughs> um, where we will have tons of people, but you want to be able to do this in ways where uh, you have adequate uh, uh, communication. And if you want, you can stream live, you can uh, stream it live to a different location and things like that. Those are the kind of use cases that we were looking at. And, and when, especially when you start to look at people also in, in high speed mobile environments, whether you're in a train and you want to watch a movie, how does the mobility actually affect your communication and you don't want disrupted uh, communication. So we're looking at huge bandwidth from that. And then we have this uh, kind of that con connected cloud computing where we have tons of data on the other side of the network that, that you need to actually communicate with as you process this data. It's like, how do we enable that? And then the immersive experiences also have become something that I think uh, growing in demand in terms of um, a use for gaming, use for education, um, even for, for um, healthcare, for therapy and things like that. Uh, that also is an application that if we looked at the 4G, um, this, it wasn't something that was sustainable at least with good, uh, with good performance and user experience uh, by 4G. So therefore 5G was looking towards um, this kind of use cases. And then uh, the, the connected vehicles, another one where um, we want our cars to be more efficient. We want our roads to be more, uh, to be more intelligent. And how do we communicate with other cars on the road to ensure that we have uh, safety and also for, for ease of driving for the driver and, and also just for, uh, for sharing of information. And, and all that is, um, it, those are the type of use cases that, that require really, really, some of them require really high speeds. Some of them require low latency and consistent performance. I, it's one thing that earlier generations could not provide. And then, like I said, this unlimited data that we are transmitting over the, the networks, those were the use cases that were driving um, the vision for, for 5G. And, and given all these use cases, uh, 5G became, um, through the activity of, of, the, of the, the standardization, but it's the 3GPP and other um, mobile technology um, standard, um, organizations, we started to look at 3G in three buckets. We, I'm, I'm sorry, 5G in three buckets. 
And this was this was uh, done so that we, we can actually kind of categorize and, and being able to home, um, have categories of requirements. So th there's three buckets in which we're looking at the services and that we wanted to provide with 5G. The first one is the mission critical. And this looks at application, for example, like, in, uh, like maybe you want um, a remote surgery that requires this uh, ultra low latency, you want really fast communication. Um, it might not be a lot of data that you're transmitting, but you want this to be fast and quick. And then you have this enhanced broad, uh, mobile broadband where you really have tons of data. This is all about transmitting data, how many uh, gigabits and, and, and that you can send over the, the network. That's what enhanced broad, broadband requires. The latency requirements are, are definitely more lax than what you would have in the mission critical um, aspect. And then you have the massive um, internet of things where you have lots of devices in the network. So this could be your wearables, it could be your, your power meters in your home. Um, in those cases, do you want something that is low powered? Um, it doesn't not, does not necessarily have to be able to transmit um, a lot of data. Um, the latency requirements also may be lax, but uh, power is definitely uh, a huge um, concern. And uh, the number, uh, the no density uh, that you have of this device is also it's a concern. So if you look at the, the, the massive um, Internet of Things um, services, we're expecting to have a 10x kind of connection density than what we had in prior generations. And we want the network to be more efficient is actually in how it handles these devices. Since there are going to be many of them in the network, um, we want a uh, 100x more um, network efficiency as, as actually as we, we support uh, the massive internet of things. In terms of the enhanced broadband, we are looking at more spectra, uh, spectrum efficiency and then the traffic density, like I said, it's tons of data, 100X is what we're shooting for. And then for the mission critical, we're really trying to decrease the, the latency by, by 10X and then also have some throughput, uh, 10X experience, um, throughput is what we're shooting for. So this were the, the three buckets in which we categorize the kind of services that, that 5G was to support. And then we were able to derive the requirements for each of these um, services. Now, given that the requirements for each of these services were actually defined, the next uh, key thing that, that the industry did was actually now to take those services and those requirements and say, let's come up with the key technology to actually achieve the requirements that, uh, that we have set out to achieve. And um, so the, the 3GPP, the standardization body for this 5G technology started with what they call the release 15 was the first version of, of 5G. So 4G, um, 4G LTE had the release 14. And then when we started 5G, we started at release 15. And uh, um, I will go ahead here and, and just spell out some of the key technologies that were driving um, the, the, the things that we see in 5G. Uh, the, the, the first one, is this um, scalable um, orthogonal uh, frequency division multiplexing. And what that just means is that um, we want to actually be able to put our data in the frequency domain, efficiently put the data across frequency in the, in the frequency domain when we transmit that data. But we, the way we want to be able to do it efficiently is to pack them in the way where we are not letting, um, if we look at this in time, um, we have efficient transmission in time and we don't allow um, inter symbol interference. So one symbol in time is not bleeding into the other. And in the frequency domain, they, they actually look at like independent uh, carriers. So this was something that had um, started off from um, the days of 4G. So it was part of the 4G technology and made its way into 5G, but in a very scalable way. So in 4G, we had our, our fixed um, bandwidth and fixed um, sub-carrier space and that each, each of the carriers we had in frequency uh, was fixed. But when we got into 5G, we really had to scale, make this scalable for different sizes and different applications. And based on what um, use case that you have or what environment you have, you can actually now change your, your sub-carrier spaces. So this allows um, to actually address this diverse services and deployment uh, uh, once. And then we have uh, flexible a uh, slot framework and, and what also this helps is that if you remember we talked about this ultra low latency emission critical type applications, uh, this slot structure. So we, we can now have a flexible stru uh, slot structure. So for example, if we have this enhanced uh, mobile broadband uh, type applications where we have lax uh, latency requirements, uh, we can use a relaxed uh, time slot. 
But when we get to this ultra low latency where we want things to be fast, we want uh, real time communication. In those cases, we could also make our, our slots even smaller so that the transmission time is much shorter. So, um, so we that this flexibility came into play in 5G and that helped accommodate all the different uh, type of um, uh, services and, and, and use cases that we were trying to look into. And then we have this advanced coding and I, I will talk more about this later, but um, in, 5, in 5G, we also added this uh, low density, uh, density parity check codes, which um, I would show uh, the performance compared to the, uh, to the turbo codes which are used in 4G. And, and, but this helped us to actually uh, do better with, with the reliability that we were adding to, to large um, data blocks. And then the massive MIMO tend to be one of the significant uh, technologies that actually came with 5G. And the idea is that now we can use large number of antennas. And uh, with this large number of antennas, we, we, we are able to communicate uh, to users um, to sim users simultaneously, to many users simultaneously, and therefore increase the capacity of our network. And uh, another big one is uh, the millimeter wave uh, technology. This also came into play um, in uh, 5G, where um, we were able to open up the spectrum and transmit a lot of data. And by that, we can actually get more capacity. And, and I will go into details so in, in this. So just a bit more on this uh, scalable OFDM. Uh, technology that I had mentioned before. In here, I'm showing um, in this uh, in this um, in this uh, slide here. I'm showing, for example, this. I said it was scalable, so you can see that the subcarrier space and how much spaces you have and the sizes of your subcarriers is actually uh, change can change based on an, if you are in an outdoor kind of a, an outdoor macro coverage, um, then you're using a, a small uh, subcarrier uh, spacing. Whereas if you go into uh, more macro density or even small cells, then you can increase uh, your subcarrier spacing here to 30 uh, kilohertz. And you can see also actually that, that our channel bandwidth, uh, carrier bandwidth also is scalable. So uh, you can go from one to five to uh, 20. And then by the time we get to the 30 kilohertz, we're entering into the 100 Mega, uh, megahertz bandwidth. So we have this scalable bandwidth too. As we are varying the, the, the subcarrier spacing, we can also vary the entire bandwidth that we are using for transmission. So um, in terms of indoors, indoors we tend to use um, a kind of a bigger bandwidth. So the channel bandwidth that we're looking at those is 160 megahertz with a subcarrier spacing of uh, 660 uh, kilohertz. And then when we even enter into the millimeter wave, uh, wave band where we have even uh, bigger bandwidth, 400 megahertz, 800 megahertz, or even two gig, uh, we are typically dealing with subcarrier spacing of, of 120 kilohertz. Um, so th this picture here uh, shows more about this um, sub uh, this flexible slot structure that I was talking about. And you can see here that uh, it, we make it scalable. And uh, based on if you're doing an enhanced uh, broadband, remember when we talked about the enhanced broadband, we talked about how this was actually um, more lax uh, in terms of its latency, but we need huge bandwidth. Uh, we can use a, a lighter slot structures, but when we uh, move to things like ultra low latency, then our slot structures in those uh, scenarios might actually be, be much smaller. And um, also we allow things like uh, like puncturing. So for example, for applications that need to go fast and quick, uh, and quick, we are able to actually puncture the entire spectrum and say, you know, I'm gonna give this tiny slot, even though I'm supposed to be doing uh, and has broad broadband here, but my ultra low latency data needs to go forth and therefore I can puncture uh, the existing broadband and, and give more priority uh, to this, um, um, the latency sensitive application. So we have all this flexibility and those are the things that actually help these different classes of services that we have to actually uh, become a reality. And then in terms of the coding, uh, this plot that I'm showing here shows kind of like a normalized throughput um, against code, code rate. Uh, and uh, the different curves, uh, the, the dark blue curve here is actually for the low density uh, parity code. And then the light blue one is for the polar code. Uh, the turbo codes is what we had in, um, in the 4G system. And um, as you can see here, as the code rate uh, uh, increases, uh, the turbo codes, especially for large uh, um, block sizes, tend to, to stay flat. But with the LDPC code, uh, um, LDPC uh, code, as we actually increase the code rate here, you see actually the normalized throughput increasing with time. So for large uh, data blocks, especially as we add more 
code rate to it, we actually can push more, more, more uh, throughput through because we are providing more reliability. And the polar codes here, actually the ones that are also, because they have an improvement at high code rate, they have been adopted for the control channel that we have in the, in the cellular network. So when we send our data for 5G, we are sending them using this uh, LDPC um, code. And that's because our, our data packets might be large. But when we send our control information, which is typically a smaller in size, we send them with this more reliable uh, polar codes um, and they are doing better than the codes that we had even in, in 4G. And also they have a uh, low latency and lower uh, complexity also. In terms of the, the, the massive MIMO, so that, like I said, the massive MIMO was another big uh, key technology that came into in, in effect in 5G. Uh, for massive MIMO, so before um, in 4G systems, we had lower number of antennas. We had probably uh, 64 antennas or, or even 32. But as we went into, uh, into 5G, we we're talking about 256 elements antennas. We we're talking about 512 elements antennas. And this is more interesting, especially when we have millimeter wave, because as we go to higher frequencies, our wavelengths are actually smaller, and therefore we can pack more antennas um, actually in, 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 a, in a compact structure. And when we can do that, uh, we are actually able to, to offer more spatial uh, degrees of freedom. And, and um, in this case, the um, one thing that is important actually for using this amount of um, antennas, especially for this, uh, this massive MIMO, even the multi-user MIMO connection is that the, the network needs to know the channel of the user. And this they do by, in this handset here, we have what are called the uplink. The uplink is really the transmission from the mobile phone to the base station. We have what are called the uplink uh, sounding reference uh, signal. Uh, this, uh, the phone will send such a signal uh, to the network. The network would use that opportunity to actually measure uh, what kind of channel the, the user has on this uplink. And because of um, in TDD system where we have the uplink and the downlink C similar channels, so we call this reciprocity, they would use um, the, the channel measured by the base station will now be used to schedule data. And we can use it to schedule data to a group of uh, users uh, simultaneously. And therefore we are actually increasing uh, channel capacity that way by doing this um, this massive MIMO. So this uh, massive MIMO design actually um, brought a significant improvement in terms of uh, capacity um, in uh, in 5G. And in terms of some of the improvement we've seen, so in uh, some of our OTA networks that we had at Qualcomm, this is an example of a massive MIMO deployment that we had. Um, and what we were looking at was um, how to use massive MIMO to actually improve coverage and capacity. So in this in this setup, we did have the 256 antennas and the bandwidth we were using was uh, like uh, 200 uh, total bandwidth. And we had a four by four MIMO, uh, which is what we would have had in 4G type system. But when we went through this massive MIMO, we will see it, we saw like a four X actually increase in, in, um, in um, uh, throughput in both the median throughput and also the cell edge, what a, a very bad user in the network who is far away from the base station would see. So this is not the best if we, we would even see more improvement if we were standing right on, the, if we we're closer to the base station. So that this uh, results that we reported are really for a median user who could be in the middle of a, of a cell or somebody at the edge. So for the worst case users, these are the type of improvements that we're seeing uh, even with this uh, massive MIMO setup. And then, um, as I mentioned, that the millimeter wave was also something that uh, was a new addition actually into the mobile industry in terms of um, our communication technology. And um, so, we in uh, 5G, we uh, we uh, we wanted to open up the band the the band actually to get more bandwidth because the bigger the bandwidth, then the more data you are able to send. Uh, so, uh, millimeter wave was giving us actually 20x more bandwidth over the band than what we had actually had initially what we have for sub six and 5G is really deployed over two set of um, bands. So we have the sub six, which is um, the, the six gigahertz and uh, less. Uh, those are typically deployed in, in 3.5 gig. And then we have the, the millimeter wave, which is which you typically see in a 28 um, gigahertz um, um, uh, frequency and even uh, 60 or, or you know, now we've been projecting uh, 71 and even beyond. But this actually gives us the, the bigger bandwidth uh, for, for communication and therefore this gigabits per second, uh, per second type data rates that we want for this enhanced mobile broadband 
uh, millimeter wave is able to, to deliver. But before it could deliver, there were a lot of uh, speculation actually in terms of um, can millimeter wave um, really deliver on this uh, promise. We know we have this big bandwidth, we know we can get lower latency, but how do we practically actually deploy this um, millimeter wave system? And that's because number one, um, everybody thinks a millimeter wave system is really too expensive um, in terms of they don't have, if, if you go up in frequency, you lose your range. So the, the range of communication is said to be low and therefore the, the, the thinking was we would need to deploy many um, millimeter wave um, cells in order to cover an area and therefore it's going to be extremely expensive. Uh, but to navigate that, some of the things that we have done in the in industry is really to um, to actually co-site them with existing cells. So if you have existing LTE cells, you put your um, millimeter wave uh, cells there and they come to augment kind of your, your capacity and, and make um, either in an indoor type of environment or maybe in a downtown hotspot scenario, um, any place where you have huge density of people and you need huge data rate, that would be the application of the, the scenario, the use case for, for millimeter wave communication. And so by co-siting with existing um, cells and, and which provide the, the, under, uh, the, the underlay of the coverage and then the capacity is provided by millimeter wave, um, the costs are actually not as um, um, prohibitive as people would have expected. Um, another thing that people um, that that was going around was that um, millimeter wave because, like I said, because they're easily it's a at the frequency where the signals are easily blocked either by human body, by building materials, or things like that. Um, that, that the communication would be very limited; that we would not be able to communicate. But things like um, advanced beam forming, and what beam forming means is that uh, we'll use these multiple antennas to actually form beam in a particular direction, and when we do that. Um, we actually, that brings uh, some gain in that direction. It cuts down the amount of interference that you see. And also it helps you also capture reflection. So some of the signals that we, uh, instead of just relying on your line of sight uh, signals, uh, when you do have reflections within the beam width, you can actually capture some reflections. And also you can vary this beam. So we have beam tracking. So we vary the beam based on the location of the UE uh, of the, uh, the user, which is the, the user equipment in this case. And as you vary, as you track the, you do beam tracking and beam steering, um, we are able to actually maintain communication and, and in a decent way. So not always needing, needing to, to rely on a, a, a straight line of sight between the, the user and the base station. Another, um, I think, um, uh, misconception was that um, millimeter wave can only be used uh, really for fixed um, fixed use, so for backhaul use, like you know, once you introduce mobility, it becomes a challenge. But in practical systems, we found that as long as you have a robust way of, of actually um, tracking your beams with, with the base station and, and following the beam, so you have the user following the beam from the base station and communicating, so you have a, a, a robust beam management um, algorithm that has actually um, kind of uh, dissipated this um, this um, misconception. And the, la the last major one I think was uh, the form factor that uh, millimeter wave uh, because of the way it was and was power hungry, you have all this, um, um, like I said, you can end up having a lot of um, RF chains due to the number of antennas uh, that you would not be able to fit them into, into a, 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 a kind of like a smartphone type form factor. Uh, but due to advances in, in RF, in antenna technology, and even uh, the, the thermal con constraints was also something that we, because we have a lot of RF chains, we'll be burning up a lot of power and therefore uh, we would run into thermal issues that those have been advanced. And, and now there are millimeter wave uh, devices uh, deployed in industry and, and um, actively working. Uh, so here I'm actually just showing some of the examples of our um, over the air network uh, that we had at Qualcomm for this um, millimeter wave um, type uh, communication. So on the left here, I'm showing a mobile handset. And uh, here we did have on, on most mobile handset with millimeter wave, we, we, we have multiple panels of um, or, or what I call sub arrays of antennas. So for example, if, um, if you can, if you're holding your phone this way, there would always be an antenna on the, on the top that would be exposed so you can communicate. So if you block the antenna on the side, there are actually sub arrays of antennas where you can actually use to communicate. So that's one of, of the things we actually use designed to actually uh, avoid this blocking effect of either the hand blocking or the body blocking. Uh, at least 
most of the time, one of this panel will be exposed and we'll be able to, to use that. And then here I'm showing this, uh, this 128 uh, element antenna where I was talking about um, us having a lot of antennas and you can use this antenna for beam forming uh, and use and, and based on the uh, different beams that the network can, can form and the user can follow this beam. So as the, the van here is moving, uh, you can see, and the, the user equipment is actually in the van, you get uh, the, the, the beam that is being used between the, the base station and the handset would, would change. And, and so you have kind of like a, a beam tracking uh, type system. So that is needed to, to create this robust communication between the base station and the handset. And um, there is um, efficient algorithms in order to do this. Um, and I think this is actually, uh, it's already been deployed and working in the industry. Uh, another uh, issue that we had talked about was this line of sight issue. So if you're in a building and you have a little bit of weight and you walk around a corner, the whole idea is that that signal disappears and, and therefore um, that you can't communicate anymore. But like as I said earlier on, because we have walls and this tend to reflect signals, you can actually, uh, based on your beam forming that gives you a gain, you can actually catch some of this reflection and use them for communication without necessarily needing this uh, line of sight signal. And then on the bottom here, I'm just showing um, that uh, if we look at the way that the phones are designed uh, with this sub array um, uh, design that we have, where we have multiple sub arrays in the phone, we're trying to have a spherical coverage. Therefore, that the, 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 the whole phone that you have actually has a good uh, signal profile, a spherical uh, signal profile around it, and it's able to have enough coverage in just in case uh, some parts of it are actually blocked. And then we have um, also the outdoor cases, not only indoor. So believe that we've does work um, indoor and in outdoor cases where you might have um, for here, for example, at the bottom here, I'm just showing the, the 30 meters uh, miles per hour kind of seamless handover where we hand over from one base station to another, even as the, uh, the user is changing uh, the beams and trying to communicate with these base stations. Um, this is, uh, so, so that's our OTA network. And then in terms of how much performance that we expect, we did, we did an experiment. Um, every year there is this um, uh, Mobile World Congress um, meeting that everybody goes to, and this is kind of a, a big one for the mobile industry. Uh, but what we did was to take um, kind of like the footprint of that, of one of the conference rooms um, at the Mobile World Congress and just a whole, uh, we would have thousands of vendors in there. And then we put down, um, we then we created an, a network simulation from here and, and put down uh, devices so that I think, I believe the total number of devices we had in this entire network was 1600 devices. And then uh, based on that, we put down the users and we, we also put down millimeter wave uh, base stations. So this, uh, circles that you see in the middle of the hall here, actually millimeter wave base stations. And then we try to cover the entire hall. We, we saw that we had good coverage. And then we were looking at this devices actually doing an upload uh, or a download of, of, of data. So in the, the case where we had the, the upload of data and we were using millimeter wave um, communication, eight, 800 megahertz was the bandwidth we're using here. Uh, the latency for, for, for example, download that we were getting was 1.9 uh, millimeter, uh, um, milliseconds. If we were to do this on LTE, we were looking at the order of 10 milliseconds or even, even 20 in some cases. So this tells us that when we have 5G uh, the, and the burst rate that we were getting was in the gigabits per second. So we had 4.5 gigabits per second uh, was the burst rate that we were actually transmitting with millimeter wave. So this is already uh, about 10x what we would have seen in, in LTE. And if you see our, like I said, in terms of our our up up our download rate um, latency, it's much more. So if you're waiting to download maybe a gigabit file instead of waiting 20 milliseconds before, or even waiting and having interrupted services with 5G, you will be able to do this in less less than two milliseconds and you are done. And same thing for uplink. So the the figure below actually shows uh, the uplink uh, scenario here, where we do have also, also almost uh, two gigabits uh, per second. Um, um, speed uh, or burst rate, as we can call it, and and also the the latency for for the the upload latency is also also um, minimal compared to what we have seen in lower generations. So those kind of capture what the the key technologies um, that actually went into into five um, G driving five G both from the 
base station side and the UE side. I wanted to emphasize another key technology actually on the base station side in terms of how the deployments will be done or are being done right now, uh, even for 5G. So what 5G really did stand, uh, started from what is called a non-standalone um, kind of like a setup. And what that means is that we have 4G network. So we have the, the core network that handles the core functions. And then we have the radio uh, network. So if you look at your base station or your tower today, it's connected to some core network where um, that connects with the application and, and billing and pricing and all that. So we have the 4G version. And what happened was when we started introducing 5G into the network, either the sub-6 version, uh, or um, which is the sub-6 gigahertz version or the millimeter wave, we just, um, we did not change the core part of the network. What was changed was actually just the base station, the, the radio access network part of it. And we just created this dual connectivity where the user will be able to connect to 4G and that becomes the anchor network. And then we added 5G on, on top of this. So this was for five, for, for a fast launch type of um, uh, requirement because you wanted to launch fast and therefore we didn't want to change the entire network. So after that was the, the first step. So it's called the, the NSA um, uh, launch of, of the 5G. And then we now moved to the version where we now have a standalone version where the entire uh, network is now changed. We're changing both the core network with, that is upgraded and uh, as we had uh, some of the, the key technologies I, I, I described uh, created uh, the key technologies at the RAN, even at the core network, we do have a lot of uh, virtualization of, of resources and, and also ne network slicing, a lot of more flexibility than we had in our 4G. And so with this, we upgraded the core network also into 5G. And then we can now have this connectivity where the, the user can connect, uh, for example, if he wants a large coverage, it could use the, the sub six gigahertz that are lower frequency, or, and if he wants high, da high data rate, high throughput, then we can use the millimeter wave. And they do this via um, either carry, what is called carry aggregation, where you have a, a band, some bandwidth in the sub six, some bandwidth in uh, the millimeter wave, and you aggregate them together and you use them for transmission. So that was how uh, they actually phased the deployments of 5G start, starting with this NSA uh, version and then now going into the standalone version where, um, where we have a full-fledged uh, 5G network um, on this place. So this was um, how the deployment um, actually went about. Um, so now let's uh, kind of look at, so get, having understood what the key technologies that was driving 5G, the next question is, have we deployed 5G yet? And yes, uh, 5G has actually been deployed um, really all over the world and in all, all the continents, uh, both uh, the 5G versions, um, we've, we've deployed the, 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 we've deployed the, uh, the sub six um, version as well as even the, the millimeter wave version. So uh, here I'm showing uh, the white dot actually shows uh, the sub six version. Um, that tends to be the frequency that is most available in most countries. So you see here that we, we have a lot of um, five, five and sub six uh, deployments all over the world. And then in, in North America, in Europe, some parts of Europe and Asia, and even Australia, we have this sub six uh, millimeter wave combo um, also has been deployed. So if we compare this to uh, the one year announcement that they had for 4G, when 4G was introduced into the market, they only had, within a year, they had four operators and three OEMs um, have launched uh, devices. Uh, now with 5G in the first year, we had 80 plus operators um, in 35 plus countries have actually launched uh, 5G. So that, that's to tell you just the kind of traction uh, that 5G is getting. And in terms of even, um, like I said, the different use cases that we expect to have, we do have the sub six and the millimeter wave being uh, launched all across the, the world. Um, even to give you more data and, and to talk about more, more of this. So we, we said that 80 plus of these operators have actually commercialized um, 5G um, and 380 plus are investing in it. So if we look at even in the United States, um, a lot of uh, Verizon, AT&T, they all have uh, 5G networks in, in thousands of cities um, in the nation. Uh, and in terms of um, how many devices, so there are over 20, uh, 200 million uh, 5G smartphones I said to have been shipped uh, by the end of 2020. Um, and, and even much more we expect in, by 2022, 
and, and uh, a billion over a billion connections by 2023. So this it's really accelerating and the, the impact of 5G, I mean, the adoption also is much faster than we've ever seen in, uh, in previous technologies. And in terms of the type of devices, uh, there are many type of um, um, devices out there, over uh, 375 plus devices are either being planned or, or already launched in the market. And so this could be smartphones, um, the 5G um, modems are also embedded in cars, uh, they're in uh, devices, they're in your laptops, um, they can be small hotspots, they can be big uh, base stations, so, uh, and all these uh, different types of, um, of uh, devices. And as you would see, as, as uh, 5G is, like I said, is expanding beyond even this uh, mobile uh, type of exper uh, um, mobile um, industry I'm going into other industries you can we will see I mean even many other devices that where we're embedding our 5g uh, modems and, and actually using this for 5g communication so like uh, so we've talked about uh, the vision of 5g the requirements the services the commercialization the question is where is 5g going and since uh, release 15 was kind of like the first version now, what has happened since then and what is happening in terms of um, design and, 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 and what new things are we expecting from, from 5G? Um, so here I am, I'm, I'm showing um, um, kind of like a roadmap of this uh, 5G evolution. Like, and like I said, and you can start to think about it as, as 5G is changing the way things are done. And, and therefore that's, that's why I, um, the title of this talk is really the revolution. We really started from this, uh, as I explained, that the three GPP is the standards body. We started from uh, the release 15 from a standards point of view. So the standards really ended in, in uh, two, uh, 2019. And then we started the commercialization and it's still uh, 5G release 15 commercialization is still ongoing. In the meantime, the release 16 uh, standards are actually completed, uh, completed in 2020. So we have some new ideas that have gone into this release 16. And some of these new ideas, um, so we, we were targeting initially, like we talked about the, 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 broad, the enhanced broadband, um, things like release 16, we're looking to find the future and saying what happens if, we're, if we want to actually uh, move 5G into kind of like industrial um, IoT type use cases. So you can think about a manufacturing floor with a lot of mobile devices in there. Um, what kind of technology do we need? Uh, we, if we have robots actually operating on 5G, uh, what kind of technology do we need? That's what we were looking at in release 16. Um, things like even on license. So most of the deployments that we did in release 15 were really on uh, license spectrum. Uh, but if we did have on license spectrum available, how do we um, communicate 5G on this on license spectrum? Because you, you might already have users in those bands. How do you access the channel without uh, causing interference to existing users or how do you wait your turn? All those were introduced in, in release 16. And then positioning was also a huge thing too, especially when you start to talk about this industry, IoT or even in the vehicular space, um, the positioning becomes a, a, an issue. So therefore we were looking at actually improving the positioning technolo um, technology that we had in release 16. And then going into release 17, which is where we are in the standards phase right now, um, we are actually at the middle, we're still working on release 17. The ideas we're looking at, at uh, what, what if we want to do uh, low complexity type 5G devices because we want to in, embed a lot of this devices in the network. Um, how do this operate? Um, people are starting to talk about uh, boundless extended real, real, reality. So VR, AR, or even mixed reality is becoming, or cloud gaming is, is getting traction. How would this operate and what do we need to actually be able to to actually uh, bring this to fruition. And then things like um, high precision positioning. So in really 16, we had some positioning. We are trying to actually improve this in, in really 17. And you see that as, as um, so that's the, the standard route. And, and once the really 17 finishes in 2020, uh, we go into release 18, where we're looking at even newer use cases, uh, newer verticals uh, to disrupt. Uh, now we're going into agriculture. Now we're going to healthcare and, and even more. So. The, the, the list continues, it, it, it continues uh, even um, as we go forth uh, into the future. Uh, and par in parallel, as we're developing on, on the standards fronts, these new features, uh, we are commercializing a lot of them and we see commercialization path, for example, um, 
16, 17, we'll, we'll, uh, the release 16 will probably start um, by the end of uh, 2021 or even uh, beginning of 2020 and then go far into the future. Um, so, uh, and I do apologize for it. Okay. So, so here I'm, let me go back to this slide. In this slide, I'm actually just uh, showing that um, kind of the new use cases that we are thinking about for this really 16 and beyond, as I had mentioned. So we have this kind of uh, port area where it's a large space. Um, you probably want to know where your, where your devices are. So you need more position and impact. We have warehouses, we have uh, mines, uh, wind farms. These are, these are typically cases where um, in the past we had not put a 5G technology, but we are looking to actually start to embed the 5G technology in those spaces, and, and therefore that and those even become critical. And then we, like I, I had talked about this industrial uh, type, um, um, kind of industrial type places where um, we actually do have all the mixture of what we had talked about. So it's not only, and we, we expect the enhanced broad, broadband, massive IoT, and then ultra low latency all fused together in one location. And that becomes a very challenging uh, a, a, a place because we are mixing together all these use cases and therefore we have different requirements. For example, your security camera has some latency that is very different from what you expect from this guy at the edge who is actually using probably is, um, is AR uh, uh, um, glasses here and the requirements, he wants low latency, but at very high data rate. Um, and that's very different from the sensors that you would have in this type floor uh, where the, the, the latencies are more lax and the, the throughput is more lax, but you might have um, thousands of the sensors in, in, in the building. So we have a, a use case here that tends, to, that it's a bit more challenging, but then how do we make this work? Those are the kind of things that we are looking at in really 16 and beyond. And in this type of environment, then we are, we're looking uh, specifically at ideas that actually allow, for example, maybe in that industrial or manufacturing uh, place, maybe what we need to have is a private network that is not necessarily connected to um, to the, 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 the back end. But in this case, where we have this private network, we can, all the data that needs to be transmitted and generated and, and communicated might, might be consumed uh, locally. And therefore we can, we can better handle all this um, diverse um, requirements and, and QoS um, quality of service requirements in this area. And also the use of uh, different types of uh, spectrum so we can have the lines spectrum, the shared spectrum, the alliances, that different application in this, that type of use case might require a uh, different type of uh, spectrum just because of the sheer differences in, in terms of the, 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 the quality of service that we might require. And then, like I said, the, the, when you have uh, robots actually moving and you want them in real time, ultra low latency um, it would be very important. This would be the enhanced even ultra low latency. So, an enhancement over what we've seen in release 15. And then we have this time sensitive where a lot of things are real time and therefore every, we need more synchronization in uh, the environment. And then positioning, as I said, is another uh, huge one. So that, that becomes, those are the, the ideas we're thinking of for this industrial IoT uh, requirements type space. And then another use case that, that um, came center forward in really 16 and even uh, going forward is this uh, vehicular uh, space. So you have this connected vehicle to X and X here could be uh, you're connecting your vehicle to infrastructure. Uh, it might be you're connecting your vehicle to infrastructure. It might be you're connecting your, your vehicle to other vehicles or to even the road itself. Where, to when we get to the point of having smart uh, transportation, the whole idea is we want to increase um, our safety on the, on the network. Uh, so in release 14 and release 15 and release 15, we had uh, some features established, but going into release 16 and release 17, we are even uh, looking to advance, um, have advanced use cases for our vehicles. So other, uh, more than just communicating with other vehicles, uh, we want to have capabilities where we can actually have uh, this increased uh, situation awareness. And in that case, you have maybe vehicle specific information that you can share with other vehicles and also with the road infrastructure. Or you can also have the sensors that are embedded in your car. Uh, in your car. Um, you have that actually is able to gather some perception of, of what is happening on the road. So based on what your sensors are seeing, there is a perception that is um, that is being um, um, predicted or, or being, uh, being put together. In that case, how do we actually share this um, perception of the road, for example, uh, with all the devices in the network. 
And also once you can share specific car information or perception of what is happening on the, on the, on the road, the question is you can start to collaborate with other cars and coordinate um, either for autonomous driving reasons or even for other, other reasons uh, with other cars in the network. And then you can also have uh, real time infrastructure. So maybe um, the net, the, we could start sharing uh, 3D maps uh, with, with cars as they're moving or, or updates about traffic and things like that. So those are kind of uh, the, the advanced use cases that we're looking at even for the, for the, for the vehicular um, use cases. And then finally, um, 5G uh, millimeter wave, as, as we saw in release 15, now in release 16 and release 17, there is a lot of activity on even how to make um, millimeter wave more robust. Um, the, the, I would just highlight a few. Um, so one of the things um, that was done in really uh, 16 is this uh, integrated access and backhaul. So millimeter wave was um, was uh, in 5G was uh, just looked um, used for this communication between the base station and the user. And then in really 16, we started uh, looking at how we can use it for the backhaul because millimeter wave, as we know, has this huge bandwidth. So we can also use it for backhaul access. So that's what is called the integrated access. So we have it uh, uh, providing access uh, technology as well as the backhaul. And that came into fruition in release uh, 16. And also enhanced beam management. Remember, we did talk about um, actually a beam tracking and, and, beam, uh, and beam steering in order to actually keep the communication between the, the user and the base station going. Um, this was enhanced even in release 16. And then power savings is actually a huge um, um, concern, especially for, for the first release where people were, were maybe concerned about how many RF chains we have or about how we're draining power. So even though 5G release 15 did a good job uh, in using um, some, um, many, some of these many techniques to decrease power in release 16, we even went forth to even improve the power consumption, especially on the device. Um, in order to actually make your, your phone battery last uh, longer than you would normally have. And, um, and like I mentioned, so things like enhanced positioning um, is also, so coming into really 17, we'll keep improving this IAB uh, for distributed uh, deployments and also the beam management is also being increased. Uh, one thing to mention, like I, I mentioned early on, um, that we are even looking at millimeter wave into higher band. So in release 17, we have a millimeter wave um, technology where we are looking into deployments in into higher bands. So release 15 um, and release 16, we're really looking at the 28 gigahertz, 39. As we go into release 17, we are looking into 52.6 gigahertz or 70, 71 gigahertz or even uh, beyond. So, um, and this is uh, my last slide here. And the, uh, in terms of, We've talked a lot about the improvements in 5G. Another um, going trend, and I would say another area where um, 5G is actually causing disruption is this strong alignment between 5G and, and AI. So in terms of we are getting tons of data, we are communicating tons of data through the network, generating tons of data, um, we need to make sense of this data. And therefore 5G and, and uh, AI actually have uh, a strong alignment and we are, we are creating that strong alignment in order to make the best use of, of technology to, 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 um, to, to create a better user experience. So in, in terms of here, in terms of we do have some type of AI on devices right now, uh, which are helping to make decisions and on, on how to, to have a good, um, good user experience. At the same time in the cloud, where if you're connecting via a 5G connection to the cloud, you do have also some intelligence on the cloud where you are also uh, mining the data and making uh, and making decisions um, going. So that's that's how the past is. And therefore today um, we see some into the intelligence on the device is actually something we're starting to do currently. And so it started actually the the, the real um, introduction of AI started with, with the cloud. That's how we knew the past. And then we, we went on to put AI on the mobile device and that became um, so something that has been done today. And then how we see it in the future is that, you know, we're really going to have um, AI really um, an edge device um, in the, the mobile network. So, so the, this cloud could have been far from the network, but an edge device in the mobile network itself that has more intelligence that is mining some data and walking back and forth with the devices or and even the, with the cloud centric AI in order to mine data. And we're going to use this data to actually improve uh, performance, capacity, and, 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 and just the mobile experience in, in general. 
So that is also a growing uh, trend and that's um, actually a significant one that it would further even revolutionize the way we use our, our mobile devices in whatever industry um, we can see for. So um, that um, really con concludes uh, my talk in terms of um, now that we are intelligently connecting the whole world uh, using 5G and, and disrupting all this, um, all this industry, we did start from this release 15 and has mobile broadband. We're going into this new industries, um, like I uh, talked about um, our transportation, um, industrial, IoT, agriculture, healthcare, and then we'll even see uh, more of this uh, releases. Um, like, like we talked about initially, it's typically a 10, uh, 10 years in, um, between one generation and the other. So we uh, 5G still has a, a long life. Uh, before it, uh, given that most of the work started in uh, 2019, or at least from a commercialization point of view. Um, so uh, we still have a long uh, sh um, life for 5G, but there are also talks about what 6G would look like. Um, but we will um, continue to see this whole disruption of, um, um, of 5G as we create, as we add this new technologies into it and, and it, using it to disrupt them. Um, even the industries and use and, and enable use cases that we have never even thought about right now and, and are coming up in the future. So um, thank you very much. And um, that concludes my talk. Oh, thank you so much. That was awesome. Uh, I've got a I've written down about a page full of questions that I have on my, my own. Uh, mm -hmm. I would love to get to them, but I will be, uh, cognizant of the fact that we have a bunch of questions from the, um, the participants. And so uh, we'll mo uh, move to those pretty quickly. Uh, everybody can see your, your contact information there on the screen. Um, and uh, these slides will be available on our website. So you don't have to furiously copy these things down. Uh, we should get them up on our website pretty quickly. Uh, but our first question uh, is really in the form of a poll. And that is uh, for, for Windsor, who's the chair of the Orange County uh, Computer Society of the IEEE. And that will be a poll having to do with how many uh, IEEE members we have in attendance uh, this evening, as well as uh, some other uh, organizations like the LA ACM chapter and uh, our student ACM chapters, if there's any, any student ACM members here. So, um, you should, if you're not using the web client, if you're using uh, the desktop app or a mobile app, uh, you should be able to see this poll and go ahead and uh, let us know if you are affiliated with, uh, with IEEE or with the LAACM chapter or with a student ACM chapter. And uh, that is our traditional first question. Um, I'll now take a look at what came in through the Q and A. Um, I'll ask all these questions before I ask any questions of my own. Um, but the first one comes from Larry Taylor and he's saying, uh, how will this work in rural areas? Uh, you need more antennas. Will it work well on bodies of water? So what do you think about that? Yeah, that's a, a good question actually. In terms of how uh, it'll work in rural areas. So definitely uh, more antennas would, would help. That is uh, definitely um, and that one way to go because then with the antennas you can get more gain and form beams in one direction and therefore um, have this communication ring. So definitely that would be uh, at least one of the uh, solutions that we would try. Another uh, one would be, uh, like I, uh, I, I don't think I mentioned it, uh, we're starting to use uh, relays. Um, that's another area where uh, we're using relays to actually increase the range. So in rural areas, maybe what you might have would be repeaters, especially if you're using the middle wave, you might have repeaters uh, or even relays that are able to communicate. Um, they would take the signal, either just amplify it and forward it or even decode it and then um, even communicate it to the next node until you cover the range that we see. So those are some typical solutions that you would, uh, you would see coming up. Uh, what about the bodies of water uh, issue? You can't really put uh, base stations out in the middle of a lake or... Uh... Right, in the ocean right. so uh that's that would be a limiting factor i guess right that that's that's definitely a limiting factor and in 3gpp what we're starting to see is this uh non-terrestrial actually networks 
uh, kind of the satellite communication is also coming to play. And those are come to play to actually address uh, such scenarios that we can address by this um, kind of technology like, uh, like we have right now. But then this uh, satellite based communications not called non-terrestrial networks that are being um, actually targeting those kind of use cases. So is that uh, for a future release like 17, 18, something like that? So you'll They're be incorporating exactly. satellite They're, base stations into a future 5G or perhaps 6G if it takes that long. Exactly. That That's the plan, I, I believe. They're in the works right now. Definitely the standards are needed and discussing what the design would be, what technologies will go into that and how they will be able to interact with the networks that we have today. Um, next question from Kay Das. Kay is the, writes the uh, Connected Vehicle newsletter for our IEEE uh, section here. So I'm sure he's very interested in what you had to say about connected vehicles. His question, he's got two questions. Uh, he says, are NOMA uh, non-orthogonal multiple access? And you talked about uh, OFDMA, but uh, non-orthogonal multiple access and network slicing included in 5G. And if so, which release? Right. Thanks, Kay. So the, the NOMA was uh, was an idea that was really percolating and, and um, had to be uh, uh, unfortunately did not go far because uh, multiple companies did not um, agree on what the technology could be. So the, the, it was definitely a good idea, uh, but I think there were a lot of, um, many companies had different visions of how they envisioned NOMA to be deployed and, and, and what the implementation would be. And because of that, because there were too many cooks probably in this, uh, trying to cook the same soup, it didn't go far. And at the end of the day it was an idea that was uh, dropped. In terms of uh, network slicing, I believe network slicing has been in phase in, in, in at least in the stand, in the first release 15 and is even being um, enhanced now, even as we go into later releases. So it came, uh, network slicing came, was one of the foundations of the key technologies in the network side that, that came into play uh, pretty, pretty early up in the game. All right. Um, next question comes from Ansel. Ansel is our SIG AI liaison. Uh, but his question has nothing to do with AI. It has to do with uh, China. Given the tension between the U.S. and China, what's the impact to the 5G development? Right. That's a very good question. Uh, so in terms of, I, I would say, in terms of at least technology development, so this 3GPP uh, body that I was talking about, who, uh, the body that standardizes the, the, the 5G new radio technology, we have many Asian companies, uh, the Huawei's of the world, the the Samsung, I mean, Samsung, um, and that Samsung is from Korea, but even uh, ZTE and, and, and all the companies coming into play, we, we come as engineers, as uh, technology people, and we come to hash out problems and to come up with features. So it's a pretty collaborative um, uh, environment. And I think um, the tensions uh, with the countries have not played much into it in the sense of people are there to just develop technology and we, we pretty much collaborate to, to, to do that and, and push that forward. Okay, so engineers are engineers the world over and they'll be able to talk to each other, but the governments might get in the way in terms of uh, how things get implemented. Um, all right, uh, Eric, uh, beyond interconnecting global communications with 5G, uh, what else can 5G be applied within the next 10 years? Right. Well, um, I think you, you gave us so a lot of examples of how 5G would be applied in the next 10 years. Um, right, right. So maybe the question came early before the, the yeah. set of slides. Uh, okay, I, I think I think you've pretty well addressed the many of the uh, current and and future uh, areas uh, use cases for the five G technology. Um, a question from Brian: You spoke about how there are several algorithms used to optimize for throughput, latency, reliability, etc. Is it possible for client devices to abuse this flexibility? Are the client devices responsible for identifying the type of transmission characteristic as it needs, or is this characteristic fixed in the client hardware? Right, that's a very good question. So, so the the philosophy of um, of um, how the transmissions are done is actually that the resources are really scheduled by the network. So the, the user uh, the user equipment or your your device can make a request on the network and say, "Well, I need this much resources to transmit or to do this," and then the network would be the one to honor it. So in terms of um, what res how resources get used in the network, it's typically a, a, a user making a request to the to the network and the, the base station. Now, um, uh, given the resources of the uh, the RAN network, given the resources to the user, so there is little room for the user itself to 
to actually abuse the resources. Um, as long as it's it's a good UE, it's not a hacked UE on the network. Um, and there are a lot of security features that actually came into play with 5G, just to ensure that all the users on the net, all the user devices on the network are actually uh, valid users. Um, and, and because of that, as long as the network can can authenticate the user and can ver uh, verify that that user is, is a valid user, uh, when the user asks for resources, is most likely will be honored as long as the, the RAN network has those resources available. Um, it, but in terms of, um, it's hard for the user itself to, to uh, it doesn't allocate resources to itself. It, that's not possible. It has to be approved by the network. All right, thank you. Uh, another question from Kay. Uh, will 5G work along with 2G slash 3G? 2G, is anybody still using 2G? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. um, so um, for definitely 4G, I think a 5G and 4G being coupled together um, is um, a walk-in scenario and that still 3G phones out there. So there may be scenarios where we have uh, 3G working with 4G and then 4G working with 5G. So your phone may actually have all this uh, modems from 3G, 4G, and 5G in, in there somewhere. And then you can, like I said, you can have 3G work with 4G and then 4G work with 5G, and that, that's possible. Uh, 2G is uh, uh, kind of, I think the use cases are definitely dying. So um, probably you would see 3G and that is also dying too, but more of 4G and 5G being coupled together. But there are definitely phones that might have 3G coupled with 4G in terms of the operation, but the phone itself might have 3G, 4G, 5G in there. Let me just interject a, my, I want a question of my own that I've been curious about. How many radios will there be in a, a modern phone that uh, is 5G capable? Um, oh, how many radios? Uh, yeah. In terms of, uh, so inside the phone, okay, what, what yeah. do you mean radios? Do you mean the, the RF chains and antenna chains or? And so, so I'm just trying to say, because when you say radio, so we have the 5G rate, the 5G modem, and then 5G modem has many antennas. Many, many RF uh, band, uh, chains. And um, I believe the maximum we can have for the UE today is it, by the standards is eight. So for the user equipment for your smartphone, you can have eight uh, antennas uh, on the phone. That's what the standard says. But then practical hands that might have two or four, um, eight might be extreme cases. Maybe those are uh, more um, non cell phone type uh, form factors or something like that. But the standards allow up to at least eight, eight ports, eight uh, RF chain antennas on the on the handset. Now that's for the 5G and then you have the, the 4G too might have its own set of antennas. And if you have 3G, it might have its own set of antennas too. But we yeah. try at least, because everything goes in a form factor, we try to limit <laughs> um, the amount of antennas and, and RF chains that you would have, yes. Okay, I'd like and to- And then go apart from the cellular, Go ahead. I, I, I'll, I'll take us a little further down that road when we have our separate Zoom meeting, but uh, let me get back to the questions that are coming in on, on the Q&A. Uh, next one comes from Steve Curler. Uh, in your view, uh, what are uh, public health implications? What are the public health implications of 5G? And you mentioned uh, health care as, as one of the, uh, the use cases. Do any of the future releases have capabilities to minimize impacts, if any? Yes, yes, yes. So that um, that has been that's a very good question, and that comes up a lot, especially when we talk about millimeter wave. Um, so what has uh, what's been done in terms of the millimeter wave aspect of it is is that um, FCC and actually some regulatory body in the mobile industry they have done research about how much exposure you can have to millimeter wave for it to cause um, any harm to the body. And because of those kind of studies, um, we do have regulations on how much power if you have a phone that you can put out because that phone is close to a user. So um, those, uh, so there, there are regulations in terms of no matter how, um, if you are operating with 5G millimeter wave, you cannot use more than this power. If you're doing sub six, you can't use more than this power. There are all those regulations that exist. And those are actually to, to, um, to make sure that, that these are not uh, harmful to the user in, in, in any way. So and, and mobile, uh, mobile um, um, products, people who make their mo mobile devices have to honor that or else their, their uh, devices will be decommissioned from the network and things like that. So those are things that we actually take seriously. We do test for those scenarios before the products actually go out. You make sure that uh, the performance that we claim, uh, we can get it even with those kind of restrictions that we are able to get decent, uh, good performance. As, and when you're in the field, you are not violating in any way those uh, those regulatory 
uh, requirements that has been placed. Yeah. Uh, of course, there is a tension between the actual science and the public perception. Um, are, are you running into right. any uh, uh, issues there? Uh, we, I've, I've read uh, many of those online and, and people saying, uh, you know, uh, I, I think there, there are really no um, uh, facts around it. At least there, there are no studies that have actually in any way uh, confirmed what some of these perceptions are about that. And, and like I said, the studies have been done by a lot of these regulatory bodies, FCC and, and others internationally, uh, to actually come up with requirements uh, in terms of how much transmit power you can actually have on your devices. Good. Uh, next question comes from Leonard. Uh, from my company, the Artificial Intelligence Economic Development Corporation, uh, how could this be used by the SMB market? Um, small, medium-sized businesses. Our current product focus is 5G cloud mobile app maker with machine learning and data analytics for small and mid-sized businesses um, that will use our proprietary technology as well as other digitization services for the front and back office. A lot there, but basically just uh, uh, the use case would be for you know SMBs, small, medium-sized businesses. Right. I would like to, without uh, giving big answers, I would like to follow up with that person doing the uh, doing the the Q and A, the open Q and A. I want to understand more about the use case, um, and then I will be able to probably give some more com comments on that. All right. Very good. Um, another question from Kay. Uh, you really piqued Kay's interest. Uh, will five G work in FDD and TDD models? Yes. Uh, good question. Yes, 5G would work in uh, FDD and TDD models. So um, a lot of the, the, remember I talked about the sub six, uh, the sub six gigahertz and then um, the, the millimeter wave. So millimeter wave right now we have mostly deployed in the, in the TDD. Um, that's the time division duplex model where you have the same channel that you're using for the uplink is what you're using for the downlink. And that's why remember when we were talking about the massive MIMO, we could use reciprocity. The channel is the same because you're using the same channel for uplink as you're using for the downlink. And in terms of how you are actually also, um, so, and that's uh, for millimeter wave, we tend to do the TDD. For a sub six, we have both FDD and TDD. So we, we use frequency in there to, to separate our uplink and downlink transmission. And we can also have TDD uh, uh, in there too. So we have flexibility in the sub six and then for, for millimeter wave because of the huge band that we have, that has been mostly TDD that's been used in uh, millimeter wave. Thank you. Uh, next question from Max. Uh, he says eight transceivers. I think when he, you were referring to eight antennas, did you mean eight transceivers or just eight receiver right. antennas? That, that it could be if you use those uh, in terms of if, uh, yeah, you can have eight um, antenna elements. Um, in terms of the receiver chain, so but like I said, the, the 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 standards allow a maximum of eight. In practical systems, you do see two transceivers, four transceivers. Okay. You could go to eight, but those are not practical. I mean, those are not in practical systems as we've seen them. Um, a question popped in from Elite: Is five G likely to interfere with any medical devices in hospitals? Um, that, so the, the interference comes if they're deployed in the same band. And as you can see, what is, what is being deployed right now, you have bands for 5G. So we have 5G lines as bands. So if we don't have any, that we don't expect any of this um, uh, mechanical uh, or healthcare devices to be operating in the band, as long as we don't have them operating in the 5G band, there shouldn't be any interference in terms of um, um, signal. We don't expect that. So most of uh, 5G's licenses, even when we have the online sense, we do have a mechanism in which we're able to sense the channel, see if there are other devices already on that. And if there are, you back up until you are actually able to get the channel. And those kind of uh, mechanisms actually make sure that you're not causing interference to any devices that are already existing in that band. Um, so that's for the devices that are going into online sense. But for the line sense one, they're typically for 5G and there should be no other devices other than uh, 5G in there, yeah. So as long as the medical device companies respect the uh, allocation of bandwidth, they should be okay. Um, Ansel uh, has another question. Do you see TCP IP continue to be the application network protocol over 5G or will it require a new uh, protocol stack to take the benefit of the 5G network? Yeah. 
I think for now, TCP IP has worked. Uh, that's an area where I'm, I'm more in the lower layers, but I would say from mm -hmm. what I, I mean, from my projection and what I've seen, um, the, I don't see much activity going up in that, in, in actually changing TCP IP. It tends to be standardized, at least for the, um, for the time of data and, and the, and the amount of data that we're getting, it seemed to be sufficient enough to support that, at least currently. So maybe in the future, when we have other use cases that we're even thinking of right now, uh, we might need to change that, yeah. So I'm gonna give you one last participant's questions. Uh, Rajesh has actually submitted a couple of questions. Uh, so this will be our last set of questions, and then we'll move over to uh, uh, the, the separate Zoom chat where people I can shut up and other people can talk to you directly. So Rajesh is saying um, on the base station side, are there any components, it's popped around, amplifiers, filters, mixers, et cetera, from the 4G standard, which can be reused for 5G or will all the components have to be replaced? Right, so things that are definitely frequency dependent uh, devices will change. Uh, so because the 5G is in a different band than, than 4G, so some of this uh, will change. Um, there are things, I think things like uh, maybe uh, memory or, or accelerators or things that are software uh, type engines are things that you can leverage and still you reuse. But in terms of some of the, the components that we have, uh, 5G just requires more flexibility. Like I mentioned, um, it's in a different band. Uh, so a lot of some of this um, mixes and accelerators and oscillators might need to, to change just to reflect the the new frequency band and also the, the range in which 5G can handle. So it's definitely much uh, bigger than what we've seen in 4G. And therefore the, the leveraging of those kind of components, at least in the front end, in the RF front end, uh, becomes limited in that sense. All right, and this is the last question for this session before we move to the, the separate Zoom meeting, uh, for also from Rajesh. Uh, for the 5G handsets, which are coming out now, uh, can the same phone support both the uh, sub six and uh, uh, millimeter wave standards? Right, a, a lot of the, the handsets, like I, I guess, uh, showed on the map in terms of the, the, that and in different parts of the world, we actually had sub six and uh, millimeter wave uh, deployed. Um, so for those handsets that are deployed in those networks definitely can support uh, sub six and millimeter wave. Uh, but for some networks that only support uh, sub six, maybe mm -hmm. the devices that they use in those networks um, might not require the millimeter wave model, even though the handset can support it. But um, definitely for the ones that can do sub six and millimeter wave, yes. Those so things. the United States was a part of that North America group that you said was supporting uh, millimeter. So are all the handsets being sold in the US now? Uh, it, so supporting both? It depends on whose network you are and what markets you are. So it, it, if I go back, I'm, um, I'm not sharing, but if I go back to that picture, not all the, the net 5G networks in America have sub six. Some mm -hmm. do have, maybe Verizon would have it in Texas, but not have it in Atlanta. Or uh -huh. So in those, it depends on where the operators are deploying both combined. And it depends on where they have the, the band, uh, the, the frequency uh, allocation to be able to do that. Um, and based on that, then the devices in those networks would actually be to to what the, the network operators are deploying in there. Okay, I, I'm going to post in our uh, our chat right now, a link to the Zoom meeting. So let me say that this is gonna to go to all participants and attendees. So I'll paste that in. So if you go to the, the chat window, you'll see a link to our, uh, our Zoom meeting, um, which we'll be moving to shortly. And uh, I, this is fascinating stuff, and it's it's this is going to be our life for the next ten years until six G comes along. So, um, okay. it, it's uh, it's really great stuff, and I, uh, I I know that there's I still have a bunch of questions on my list that I need to ask Lola. Um, but uh, for the rest of you, thank you all for participating tonight. Uh, I, I will remind you again that in two months we'll have a um, another meeting about uh, privacy and the new California privacy law, uh, and. Once again, there is that privacy forum coming up uh, next week on Wednesday and Thursday. If you look search privacy OC uh, on, on the web, you can find information about that. Um, but again, I wish we could give Flo a round of applause. So just, you know, a, a Zoom applause for Lola. Great talk, uh, wonderful having you here. And we hope to see you on the other side in the, uh, the Zoom meeting. Uh, so click on that link and uh, we'll, we'll see you in a few minutes over on the other side. Alrighty. Okay. Um.